I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, this evening's lecture, and I'd like to introduce the chair of this evening's lecture, Professor Richard Dawkins. Dan Hedges is an extremely distinguished philosopher who has made contributions to a wide range of philosophical topics, including uh, free will, consciousness, philosophy of mind, evolution, and of course, religion. Uh, he is more than just a philosopher, he's also a scientist. Um, he is the sort of philosopher that scientists like. I don't think I've ever met a scientist who doesn't approve of Dan Dent, and scientists disapprove of quite a lot of philosophers, so that's a, um, that's a, that is an accomplishment. He's also more than just a scientist and a, a, and a philosopher. When I say a scientist, he, he, among philosophers, he's very unusual in that he actually bothers to learn some science, he actually understands what makes scientists tick, he goes and visits scientists, he uh, keeps up to date with the latest scientific literature. Many of the new fact in my own field that I learned first from Dan. He's also a, a master of the explainer's art. He's a brilliant explainer. He really goes to the trouble of making sure that his readers or listeners understand. In that respect, he is just like Darwin. Well, he's just like Darwin in other respects as well. <laughs> But um, when, you, when you open a book by Darwin, you immediately feel, here is a man who not only is a great thinker, but actually wants to be understood. That cannot be said of all philosophers. I heard, <laughs> I, I, I heard a story of a philosopher of a very different kind who was, was uh, at a party, and a young woman came up to him and said, oh, Dr. So-and-so, I found your latest book very difficult to understand. Oh, thank you very much! <laughs> uh, of those who have been dubbed, for better or worse, horsemen, uh, the four horsemen of whatever it is, um, <laughs> there, are, there are some of us who are content to simply pour well-deserved scorn on religion. But Dan doesn't do that, um, well, he does sometimes, but mostly he, uh, he, he asks us to study religion. And that's a much more constructive approach than, than some people would say people like me do. Um, <laughs> and so, and I think that's probably part of what he may be going to talk about tonight. Uh, in any case, I know it would be enormously entertaining and interesting. He's going to tell us a Darwinian perspective on religions. Thank you, Richard, for that wonderful introduction. It's, it's a, an honor and a thrill to be here today. I, I, I don't know, Richard, what you're talking about. <laughs> He's on a beach with his stunning girlfriend, German actress Diane Kruger, and he wants to read a tome on the rationalism. I showed this slide in a talk at, at Dartmouth, and I said, you see guys, it's a chick magnet. <laughs> so remember that, atheism is a chick magnet. So, as Richard said, I think we should study religion, because 
who knows what's going to happen to it? Here, here are five different scenarios for what might happen with religion in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, some people might think that the Enlightenment is over and that religion is going to sweep the planet. I think that's extremely unlikely. Some people think that religion is in its death throes, including some religious people. Just a few days ago, in the Christian Science Monitor, the remarkable piece, The Coming Evangelical Collapse, by one Michael Spencer, who was himself an evangelical. He says, within two generations, evangelicalism will be a house deserted by about half of its occupants. Between 25 and 35 percent of Americans today are evangelicals. In the Protestant 20th century, evangelicals flourished, but they will soon be living in a very secular and religiously antagonistic 21st century. He is wringing his hands. Some of us are not so sure that this is anything but a cause for uh, congratulations. <laughs> and indeed, just out recently is the uh, American Religious Identification Survey, which is done every few years. This is the 2008 survey, and it has some remarkable facts in it. The category of none, that is what religion uh, uh, do you have, uh, the category of none is the fastest growing category of all in the United States. It was 8.2% in 1990, 14.2% in 2001, it's 15% today. So in, in just less than 20 years, it's, it's basically doubled. Um, and in fact, uh, as the survey goes on to say, the nuns are the only group that have grown in every state of the union. And more they say, we can observe that in 2008, one in five adults does not identify with a religion of any kind, compared with one in ten in 1990. So these are these are striking trends, and uh, uh, I see no sign that they're not going to continue and maybe even accelerate. In other words, it may well be that within our own lifetime, this Vatican building may become the European Museum. <laughs> <laughs> or Benedict keeps putting his foot in his mouth. <laughs> that may be something else. Can we imagine that this might become Disney's magic? <laughs> Outlandish and preposterous, we should remember that the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul started as a church, then it was a mosque, and now it's a museum. You never can tell. But there's other possibilities. Another possibility is that religions might transform themselves into sort of creedless moral teams. And there's signs that this is happening. You keep the pageantry and you add to it. We're very good at pageantry, and it's wonderful stuff. And uh, drop the creed entirely and just engage in different kinds of, of excellent works around the world. If that were the future, I think most of us would be very content to see it happen that way. Another possibility is that religion might diminish in prestige and visibility rather than the way smoking has. Hard to imagine just 20 years ago that we would have smoke free pubs and restaurants in England, and now we do, and it's amazing that it works out very well. I think that prospect, by the way, is particularly pleasant. The idea that there might be a time when, when you have to say to people in the United States, Shh, don't mention that he's religious. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. He can run for office, even. The fact that he's religious shouldn't be held against him. <laughs> the other prospect. <laughs> God's chosen king destroys the world. Again, uh, so, so there's five prospects, <laughs> and quite frankly, we don't know which of them is true. I think most of us are pretty sure about several of them, that they're not true. But since they're not all equally valuable, equally desirable, it really does behoove us to study religions as natural phenomena so that we can repair our ignorance on this and do whatever steering we can to bring about the world that we would most prefer. Well, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to adopt this from a scientific point of view, and it sometimes helps if you're going to be scientific about anything to get a little distance from it, to pretend you're a Martian. So try to imagine, if you will, that Martians come to Earth and ask what they would see, what they would notice about our planet. Well, this is one thing that they might well notice. Um, uh, I've been showing this slide a lot, so some of you may know. What do you think this is? Is it something you think it's a whale? Or is it a tongue? Or is it a 
petri dish full of with bacteria or something. Actually, what it is, is a picture taken from a satellite of over a million people on the banks of the river in northern India. This is one of the largest gatherings of, of vertebrates <laughs> ever in any one place. You think about that. Biologists would certainly be fascinated. You think the, the plains of the Serengeti. This is, this is an equally stupendous biological phenomenon, getting that many people in such a small space at one time. Here's another smaller version of a similar gathering, and yet another. So the Martians would certainly be interested in this and wonder, what on earth is this all about? What is this in Ada? You don't get costly events like this for free. Something has to pay for them. There has to be some, ultimately, biological basis that will pay for such an amazing expenditure of energy and time. So they would want to know how does it originate and what is it for? And how does it perpetuate itself? For this, you need a Darwinian perspective. Now here's a cow. Not a sacred cow, but a very nice cow. At least I don't think it's a sacred cow. And a question you might ask about this cow is who designed it? And the answer is actually a little bit complicated, because quite a lot of people have actually played quite a role in the design of this modern milk cow, but it is, like all modern milk cows, a descendant of the aurochs. Who designed the aurochs? Nobody. Evolution by natural selection designed the aurochs. <coughs> what are aurochs for? Or were they for? They were for making more aurochs. That's all they were for. And over millions of years, many of their design features were fixed. This then became the foundation on which human beings took over, domesticated <coughs> the aurochs, and began to reverse engineer the cow to make it into something that they wanted, something that was better for their purposes than one of those wild aurochs. So the cow we see today is a an, an entangled mixture of design features consciously favored by breeders, and I think now today probably by genetic engineers as well, and, uh, and also with features that were designed simply by natural selection. And the same thing is true of religions. Religions are brilliantly designed products, and they have an evolutionary history. And we should try to understand what makes them tick, how their parts work, why their parts are disposed as they are. In other words, the task that I'm calling for is the reverse engineering of religions. Now, people have been studying religions for thousands of years, some with scientific objectivity and a lot of scholarship. But I don't think this approach has been at the top of their minds most of the time, and I think it's a very good approach which will get us closer to the facts that we particularly want to know about religions. So, although this is a, a process of reverse engineering this in its earliest days, uh, I'm going to sketch out what I think it looks like so that we can see what, what further questions need to be asked and answered. Pretty clear that language had to evolve before religion. And when and how language first emerged in our species is still anybody's guess. But it may be only a few hundred thousand years old, or it may be a half a million years old. It may be somewhat older than that. And almost certainly it grew up out of proto-languages. And people have various good and not so good ideas about how that might have, might have gone. And uh, I think we'll make great progress on that question. Uh, but in any case, we can be pretty sure that religion uh, was it had to come after the evolution of language. Well, who invented words? Well, nobody invented words. There are hundreds of thousands of words. In your own vocabulary, there are probably 50, 60, 70,000 words. And of those words, a very, very few were invented by anybody. You all know that one word invented by somebody in the room, the word meme, 
invented by Richard Dawkins. But that's, that's a very rare thing for a word to be invented. Uh, probably much less than one in a thousand of the words in your vocabulary was invented by any particular person at any particular time. And probably not one in a thousand attempts at coining a word are successful in that the word flourishes and replicates and enters the vocabulary, enters the dictionary. <coughs> mean is in the OED. One of those rare successful coinages. There is a tremendous diversity of words. Where did they all come from? Well, they all came from an evolutionary process. There are now, today, still, probably about 7,000 languages. Although a language is going extinct about once a week. If you know somebody who's looking for a good thing to do, becoming a field linguist and saving the knowledge of the dying language is an excellent job, and it has to be done now. This is work for intrepid field workers right now, get the training to go out, because a language is a tremendous store of information, of knowledge. It is a tremendous store of cultural design. And every time a language goes extinct, that's like the loss of the species, a tremendous loss. Could they have had a common ancestor? Well, yes, in fact, they could. Almost certainly they did. Here is a, a, a lovely new diagram of the Tree of Life uh, by Leonard Heisenberg. One of, my, one of the best representations I've seen of the Tree of Life. Way over on the right, you see the mammals that were recently branched off. Uh, uh, you see the uh, bacteria in the archaea and the eukaryotes over here on the left. But uh, time is, is uh, uh, radially going out. The, the, the far edge is the present. This is what's right. So that's, of course, is a well-known, it's, it's called a phylogenetic tree. Oh, We're all familiar with phylogenetic trees, but there are also glossogenetic trees, which look at languages. Here's the Proto-Indo-European languages. Here's the Finno-Ugric languages, the languages of China, the Proto-Line languages. Scholars have worked these out in great detail. And one of the things that they've discovered, and it's obvious <coughs> in retrospect, is that horizontal word transfer wreaks havoc with the tree of language. Just think of English. There are thousands of words of English which come from French and German and Russian and Eskimo and every other language practically in the world, and they are now parts of English, but of course they, they came from languages which split from English uh, uh, thousands or tens of thousands of years ago. Um, that's a biologist would call that anastomosis, branch joining, horizontal transmission. It's right from language, and so follows that words are more trackable items than whole languages. We can look at the, at the etymology, we can look at the, at the evolution of a single word, a word like table, or chair, or verb, or, or home, or any word you choose. And it is a, it is a more trackable object than, than a language itself. Just like genes. Horizontal gene transfer now has led people to agree that gene flow, genes, the evolution of genes is a more trackable subject than, than the phylogenetic trees, although there's still the trees, of course. Now, a little ontology, since I'm a philosopher, I get to do some ontology. How many of you have words in your ontology? You, you, uh, you uh, believe in words, you think words exist. <laughs> How many of you think chairs exist? How many of you think elephants exist? How many of you think words exist? Where do you think numbers exist? <laughs> Pretty soon we're in a philosophy. But words are fairly unproblematic items in most people's ontology. Well, little quiz. Dogs are a kind of, well, a kind of mammal, of course. They're also a kind of pet. What are words a kind of? <laughs> Noise? Sound, noise, not really. The sign, communication. They're a kind of meme. 
<laughs> words are means that can be pronounced. Words are means that can be pronounced. There's lots of means that can't be pronounced. But words are perfectly good means. They just happen to be the subset, the sub-variety, the ones that can be pronounced. And it is just unquestionable that one, nobody designed them, two, they differentially replicate, three, they're not passed on genetically, but only by cultural transmission and evolution, uh, and that they are themselves, in many cases, brilliantly designed. And nobody did the designing, so they have to be designed by a process of natural cultural evolution, natural selection of cultural bias. <coughs> Part of the brilliance of the design of words is a feature that is brilliantly brought out in this famous diagram by my late lamented friend, Oliver Selfridge. What do you see? The cat. But notice that the so-called H and the so-called A are exactly the same symbol. If you copied this, you would fix the first one by straightening up the sides, and you fix the next, the last one by uh, closing up that gap at the top. This feature of language is actually digitization. It is what permits the correction to norms on the basis of contextual evidence, both sloppiness, noisy transmission. Now, this is written words, but I want to make the same point about spoken words, which are much more important in the history of means that I want to talk about today. So now, I want you to repeat after me. Are you ready? <laughs> Modify the epigastrium. Again. Again. Okay, no trouble, right? Here's number two. Repeat after me. Why do you know why you didn't know? Okay, now do it again. I spoke just as clearly, just as loud, but the sound that came out of my mouth was not digitized for you because it was not composed of the finite phonemes, the finite alphabet of phonemes of the language you knew. And of course, if I said something in Turkish or Chinese, you would have had a hard time too, because you don't know the norms of pronunciation. But you had no trouble with Mundify the Epigastrium, even though you, you probably never heard it in the Italian. Who knows if they're even words? This was actually what my mother's old lawyer used to say when he came over about supper time, said he, time to Mundify the Epigastrium, by which he meant he wanted a drink. <laughs> Officially, it means to soothe the lining of the stomach. <laughs> So, the point is that language, and nobody dreamt this up, nobody designed this, language evolved to have this wonderful property of digitization. Modify the epigastrium, modify the epigastrium, modify the epigastrium. Differences in tone, in, now in writing, in font, in the size of the letters, these are all ignorable variations, and we have these norms that are preserved through copying. It is this capacity for digitization of means that is actually the key to their high fidelity replication. Same as it is, by that matter, for that matter, of DNA. The A, C, G, and T of DNA are a similar alphabet. It's these that permit us to identify typos. They're typing errors which can be corrected because context lets you correct them. My software engineer friends, my computer hacker friends, have a lovely term, which is like typo. They talk about thinkos. <laughs> Whoops, I made a thinko here. Or I think you made a thinko. What's a thinko? A thinko is a semantic typo. It's not a slip of the finger. It's a slip of the mind. But it's only in a context where there's clearly a better or right way of doing it, and you've done it the wrong way. You've not closed your, your loop correctly. You have not uh, uh, organized the order of calling subroutines or whatever. You've made a think of. These are correctable, un unproblematical. 
And in fact, it's the fact that we have not just one set of thinkos, we have lots and lots of semantic alphabets. For every human profession, there are, in effect, semantic alphabets. If you have ever made a pot, you've ever taken a pottery course, and learned how to throw a wheel on the pot, once you've learned that, you can now see things when you watch another potter making a pot that other people can't see. You watch that potter, you say, oh, let me see, one of those, one of those, one of those. One of those. For you, that's like mundify the epigastrium. For somebody who doesn't know pottery, it's really you. You, just, you can see it, but you can't take it apart into its parts. When well, you can take it apart into its parts, you have parts that will replicate with high fidelity. And that's why we're the only species that, although there is cultural transmission of a very limited sort in chimpanzees, it never, and, and maybe some other species, a little bit, maybe in some whales, it never builds, it never becomes really ramified, it never, never goes recursive. And the reason is that they don't have alphabets. They don't have the digitization that language gives us. Oddly enough, we philosophers, we talk about language so much and we go on and on and on about comprehension and how important comprehension is, ignoring the fact that one of the really brilliant design features of language is that it permits transmission without comprehension. You don't have to understand the words to transmit them with high fidelity. In fact, sometimes it helps if you don't. Because if you understand them, then you make corrections because you think you know what the author or transmitter meant. You'd be better off if you just treated them verbatim. It's this power of language to permit transmission and storage, replication without comprehension, that is the key, in fact, to the accumulation of culture in our species, and of course, the accumulation of religious culture. So I'm going to talk about three phases in the history of religious themes. Uh, the first is the synanthropic, then there's the domesticated, and then there's the domesticated. So let's look at synanthropic means first. Well, what does synanthropic mean? It's a term not widely used, but here are some species that are synanthropic. Rats, squirrels, pigeons, crows, bed bugs. These are not domesticated species. Nobody owns them. Nobody tries to preserve them. They're wild, but they're not wild. They are with anthropos. They are with human beings. They have evolved by natural selection, not by unconscious selection, not by artificial selection, they have evolved by natural selection to thrive in human company. They, they thrive in human niches, if you will. So those are synanthropic animals, insects and the like, but there are also synanthropic means. Words, perfect example of that. They don't belong to anybody, although nowadays we have word mavens and grammar skulls and people who take it upon themselves, like the Académie Française, to preserve and foster only the best and the purest strains of French, for instance. Uh, that's entirely unnecessary. Words will make it on their own, just like pigeons. Whether you want them to or not, they survive quite well. Superstitions are another nice example of rumors of means that are synanthropic. They are not under protection. They have, they have no students. How do they get started? Well, that's a good question. And I'm going to give a sketch of a sketch of how some religious synanthropic means got started. First, by describing an instinct that we share with other mammals. Uh, some of you may have experienced this recently. I know you don't get much snow in, in, in England, but you had some this winter. <laughs> and maybe you're sitting there in a chair and some snow falls off the roof and it lands with a thud outside the window, and your dog jumps up and goes, The dog is basically saying, who's there? Who's there? Not what's that, but who's there? The dog is looking for an intruder or a, a, a predator or a rival. Uh, this 
hair trigger response to anything surprising and perhaps a little bit frightening, treating it as an agent has been called by uh, 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 Justin Barrett, hyperactive agent detection device. Or in my own terms, this is when your, your intentional stance disposition is on a hair trigger. You see something puzzling and you think, who? Why? What does he want? It's a good thing to have on a hair trigger because sometimes in the, in the past, the answer has been, he wants you. <laughs> you always want to know that. So it's good to have a disposition on a hair trigger to treat anything the least bit frightening or puzzling as an agent. Now the dog, lacking language, looks around a little bit and then nothing there, goes to sleep. But human beings, <coughs> and what can happen in the human case is that rarely, every now and then, something amazing can happen. Now, when I talk about evolution, I often like to say, the thing about evolution a lot of people don't understand is that it's the amplification of what almost never happens. Mutation almost never happens. So without it, you wouldn't have evolution. Among mutations, but beneficial mutations almost never happen. But without it, you wouldn't have evolution. Speciation almost <coughs> never happens. Every birth and every lineage is potentially a speciation of that. Not one in a million is. But evolution is a process that depends on the very rare event happening that then gets amplified into something remarkable. So here's a little sketch of a sketch of what might happen. Okay. You and your friend are out in the woods, you're walking along in the dark, and you hear a noise. Whoa, 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 who's that? What, what? Whoa. Oh my god. Oh my god. That tree. I could have sworn that tree said something. <laughs> oh, come on. You think it's a talking tree? Well, it seemed like a talking tree for a moment. A talking tree? Do you think it's a talking tree? You think it's a talking tree? Well, it seemed just for a minute like a talking tree. Hey, Fred, he thinks he's seen a talking tree. He thinks he's heard a talking tree. Talking tree, talking tree, talking tree. What, about ten times? We have the birth of a meme, the talking tree meme. Now, mostly, Nine times out of ten, ninety-nine times out of hundred, nine hundred ninety-nine times out of a thousand, that's the end of it. People laugh, go home, that's the end of it. But once in a while, <laughs> it grows, and it grows, and pretty soon, everybody in the village knows about the talking tree. Now, they don't have to believe in it even, they've just heard it. They can have very different ideas of it, but the idea for that village is, the talking tree meme has got to start. It has been amplified by replication to where it's spread. It's even sort of gone to fixation within a certain population. And pretty soon we get fairies and ogres and nymphs and sprites and all the rest. We get a population of imps, goblins, fairies, gods, leprechauns. Everywhere we look around the world, in every culture, every they have quite a menagerie of such, well, they know what they look like even though they're invisible. <laughs> the ones that we hear about have won a rather severe competition for, survival, for rehearsal space in the minds of the people in those communities. The ones that have survived are the ones that are unforgettable. The forgettable ones are forgotten. These have to be vivid, provocative, challenging, weird, quirky, off the wall, something about them or, or just charming, just delicious, or frightening. They have to have some set of those properties. The ones that have the right set of those properties uh, get, a, get a good foothold in the uh, folklore of those people. What are those winners for? They're for occupying the minds they find themselves in. That's all. When I first started talking, writing about religion, studying uh, the evolution of religion, I often got from people the following, uh, oh, oh, that's interesting then. Uh, gee, what do you think religion is for? I mean, every human group that's ever been studied has some sort of religion. It must be good for something. 
Um, what do you think it's good for? I said, well, every human group that's ever been studied has a common cold. What do you think it's good for? <laughs> it's good for itself. The ubiquity of a cultural item is no guarantee that it's good for anything except for making more of itself. Like an aurox, or a bed bug, or the common cold. These are the synotropic means that are the ancestors, literally the ancestors of the gods that become the chief characters of the world's religion. Now, how clever it was of sheep to acquire shepherds? <laughs> Look what they got from them. They could outsource all their problems, protection of predators, food, food finding, health maintenance, all at a cost of the loss of humanity. And not even that. It was a great deal for the sheep. And as you may know, the brains of domesticated animals are smaller than the brains of their nearest wild relatives, even when you uh, regularize the body weight for muscle mass and things like that. It's why? Because Use it or lose it. They don't need their brains. They can be stupid because they've got stewards that are taken care of. Now, it was clever, of course, but it wasn't the sheep's cleverness. I just said, sheep are stupid. They are. <laughs> but it was a great move in design space for those sheep. There are hundreds of millions of sheep in the world today. And you could probably carve off their nearest wild relatives in a, in a few arcs. So from a fitness point of view, it was a great idea to go domesticate it, but it wasn't their idea. It's a case of Orville's second rule, evolution is cleverer than you. <laughs> it was a brilliant stroke, but no sheep gets credit for it. And like sheep, the wild means of religion got themselves domesticated. The original synanthropic means had to be catchy, viral, unforgettable. But once they acquired stewards, they had people who were prepared to devote their life and energy to preserving and replicating these ideas. So we get the domestication of the means. When did this happen? Well, it's hard to say, of course. Um, I guess at least 20,000 years ago, because 20,000 years ago we see the first ritual burials, and that's at least a pretty good fossil trace. Uh, we can argue about that. Agriculture has only been around for about 10,000 years, and certainly by the time we have settlements, by the time we have agriculture and domesticated animals and domesticated plants, we have domesticated meats. So the domestication of meats is roughly contemporaneous. This is a very recent biological development. To give you a, a few benchmarks, Judaism, the oldest of the, of the, of the uh, established uh, uh, religions, is probably no more than 3,000 years old. And of course, it's important to remember, to realize, that the religions that survive today are like the languages that survive today, or they're like the species that survive today. They are a tiny fraction of the religions that have existed in the past. For every religion that survives today, there are probably a hundred or a thousand that have gone extinct. We just don't know. But there's every reason to believe that there have been many, many more religions that have come and gone and have in most cases left no trace. So the ones that survive have got to be well designed. When we became conscious, deliberate stewards of our ideas, this changed everything, just as it did with the cow and the aurox. The word Islam, it means submission in Arabic. It means surrender of self-interest to the will of Allah. But it's not just Islam that has this idea. Christianity does too. This is a, a poor photograph of a, of a page of a, of a music manuscript from the 16th century that I got about 50 years ago in Paris Bookstall. And um, actually it's interesting because there's a, there's a nice mimetic typo in it. Um, chi, Rho, R. That's Christus. The first two letters are Greek. 
And whoever did the writing didn't realize that rho was the Greek letter for R. So it's added an extra R. So here, so what does it say? It says, Samen es verbum dei sator autum Christus. The word of God is a seed, and the sower of the seed is Christ. And all who uh, hear him will have eternal life. That's the quid pro quo. Another common Christian idea is the part of worship is surrender. Surrender people obey God's word even if it doesn't make sense. These last two quotes come from a contemporary source. They come from Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life. So this idea of human beings becoming the servants or slaves of an idea, of a mean, is common in fact to really all the organized religions. Well, what are these domesticated means used for? Well, uh, as decision aids, um, when, you, when you're in a, in a bind, you don't know whether to do A and B, you, you ask the oracle, or you ask God, and you squint to strike and consult the tea leaves or whatever you do, and God gives an answer. And what's really nice about this is that if God told you what to do, and it turns out to be bad, don't ask me. I'm just God's messenger. You can blame God that told you. Uh, it's a nice trick. And look, if nobody had to invent it. Nobody had to invent it any more than they had to invent the words that were used. These could just evolve by differential replication. Uh, as placebo effect props, I think this is my, one of my favorite ideas, but I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I kind of spell out, I spell that out in my book. Um, it's such a nice idea, though, and, and it's the one that's closest to, to, to getting some confirmation. Most religious traditions, if we go way back, have, have, have sh shamanic ritual healing of one sort or another. Witch doctors have ritual healing uh, as part of their, of their ancestry. And those shamans all developed highly elaborate bedside manners, um, ritual ways of presenting the potions and, and herbs and things. And those too, of course, many of them were highly effective. as painkillers and hallucinogens and so forth. Now, some people, presumably, were not very susceptible to those rituals. They weren't turned on, they weren't, they weren't electrified, they weren't put into a sort of a hypnotic state by those rituals. Well, if so, then they didn't have any health maintenance organization. You didn't have any health insurance if you weren't susceptible to ritual, because that was a big part of what, what you could get in the way of health. So it's very likely, if you want to have a Darwinian of evolutionary explanation of why so many of us should be so moved by ritual. It could well be that our ancestors who were similarly moved by ritual had health improving phenomena that they, they could benefit from the from the ministrations of those shamans in a way that people that had a, a ten year for ritual could not. And of course everybody knows the use of God's as surrogate police. Um, don't do it because God is watching you. It's a very familiar idea. I want to point to a few adaptations that are just of organized religions. Not of the earliest domesticated religions, sort of folk religions, but of later organized religions. Don't blame God, but thank God. In other words, when the tsunami happened, there was a veritable chorus of people saying, don't blame God, it's not God's fault, it's not God's fault. But when good things happen, thank God. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a one-way proposition. This is only in organized religions. In folk religions, they blame their gods all the time. <laughs> this was very much a part of the early folk religions. I've already quoted this, surrender people obey God's word even if it doesn't make sense. This glorification of the incomprehensibility of whatever is being said, just so we don't have to worry about the implications thereof from reform. Another clever adaptation is don't ever try to argue with the devil, he's better at arguing than you are having had thousands of years of practice. <laughs> this is a particularly insidious 
adaptation because notice it's a wild card disarmor of any reasonable person. The more reasonable, the more open-minded, the more affable you are, you say, come tell me about your religion. Go and talk to that person, that person's the one. So a wild card for disarming any reasonable criticism. And then the all-time most important that belief in God is a requirement of morality. This is the one that I think most engenders uh, allegiance and sacrifice on the part of the vectors of the God. I took this photograph in rural Maine. <laughs> Good without God becomes zero. <laughs> it's cute. It's a cute little meme. It's just false. That's very important to say and acknowledge that it's false. Well, some people think that the main role of, of religion is to play the role of Dumbo's magic cutter. How many of you ever saw Dumbo when you were kids? Or how many didn't see it? Well, it's a, it's a classic, it's a classic movie. Dumbo has these great figures and he can actually fly, but he has to be convinced that he can fly. And the crows come up with a very clever idea of giving him what's obviously not a magic feather at all. He holds the magic feather in his trunk, so now he can fly. It's a, it's a, it's a crutch. It gets him up and going. Uh, and it, it, it provides him with the moral oomph he needs, or the courage he needs to launch himself uh, off, of a, off of a high place and learn that he can fly. So what if religion is, is Dumbo's magic feather? A lot of people think it is. Well, Dumbo needed to find the courage and the conviction that to be all that he could be, as the army slogan has it. So some people think that religion is perhaps a sort of morality prosthesis. But remember, Dumbo threw away his crutch. And I think we are ready now to do away with the crutch of religion. Do we still need religion? <clears throat> when I first went to reseed my hay field in Maine, my farm, my neighbor said, well, Dan, says, when you plant your timothy, that's the hay, he says, you want to plant oats as a nurse crop. What's a nurse crop? He says, well, it comes up first, and it shields, it, it shelters the timothy until it can get a good start and keeps down the other weeds. It's just a sort of scaffolding to get the, to get the, the hay up. And when you can, once, once the timothy's established, you can just cut the oats. You can use it as oat hay or you can harvest the oats, but use it as a nurse crop. And I've kept that idea of a nurse crop in my head ever since. I think, well, maybe religion was a sort of nurse crop. Maybe we needed religion for a few thousand years to uh, sort of hold things together in society until we could develop the sort of secular institutions that could make them go without the benefit of, of the religion. So I think this is a question of whether religion is good for humanity today. And most people think so. I think most people think so. And this creates a problem because there's no good reason to believe in Zeus or Thor or Poseidon or Zoroaster or Jehovah or Allah. <laughs> But there are good reasons to say it. Well, it's mainly to protect the magic feather. Well, is there any harm in keeping the magic feather myth alive as an official lie? And I say yes, it is. I'm going to give you three reasons. You'll be giving me a lot more. One is the sort of protective coloration, that benign religion provides protective coloration to toxic movements. And there certainly have been toxic movements. Like Jonestown, we had the 30th anniversary of that a few days ago. Or the preposterous case of, of uh, Paravis Kambach, who was, uh, initially was sentenced to death for blasphemy in Afghanistan. This has been commuted to 20 years in prison, and I just read in the paper today that um, he may get a new trial. We may finally get him acquitted. But the very idea that there could be a law making blasphemy a crime in the 21st century is, I think, fairly preposterous. Second reason is systematic hypocrisy. In the United States, an atheist cannot yet, with one or two exceptions, be elected to high office. But I think this is changing. An Episcopal priest that I interviewed for my book said, when I found out what my Mormon relatives meant by God, I rather wish they didn't. <laughs> but of course, he won't say that in public. He won't say that in the public. 
So we have systematic hypocrisy on a huge scale. And finally, the danger of religion is that it encourages irrationality. I did a debate in London uh, a year or so ago with Lord Winston. And the question was, is religion the greatest threat to a rational scientific worldview? And I took the question literally, I said, well, maybe, let's see, what are the, what are the rivals? What other great threats to uh, the rational scientific world you are? Well, there's alcohol, <laughs> there's drugs, there's, you know, violent video games. But I think religion is greater, a greater threat than all of those, because it has something that they don't. Even though all of these do, in fact, do have the power to disable people and make them less rational. Religion doesn't just disable them, honors the disability. And that is the really dangerous feature of religions. But I think we can take steps to minimize these three defects and create and encourage the evolution of a virulence in the means, the religious means that we have left to the point where they're not harmful at all. After all, each of you, as you are sitting there, has about 100 trillion cells, and 9 out of 10 of them are human. You have roughly 10 times as many symbiont visitors in your body as you have human cells. They each have their own genes, their own genomes, and of course, they're mainly completely harmless, and some of them you couldn't live without. The virulent ones, the toxic ones, this, the, the parasites are a tiny minority. If we can encourage the evolution of avirulence in religions, then we can solve the problems that religions cause. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, eight years ago, this slide was very much in evidence. And at the time, well, you know, four years ago, I found, I found this slide, which was nice because it, it put each of the states in the actual proportion of Republicans and Democrats, right and left, that, was, that you could see that the whole country was actually uh, pretty purple. It was nowhere near as bad as the previous slide had suggested. Now here's 2008, I'm happy to say. And if you look at the map more closely to see um, where the pockets are, you see that the, even the idea of, of, of the Bible Belt, even the idea of, of the, the sort of completely saturated red states is, is a thing of the past and becoming ever more so. Now, finally, <laughs> some of you may have noticed I have a Darwin pin with the little, little uh, legs on it that's uh, evolving. <laughs> and, uh, I, was, I was at a conference and the physicist Murray Gell-Mann saw it and said, I like your pin there. And did you know, of course, that the Christian fish uh, is the world's first acronym. That, that acronym ichthys. Ichthys is the Greek word for fish. And that stands for Jesus Christos Theo Ios Soter, which is Jesus Christ, God's Son and Savior. I said, well, I've heard that, but thanks for telling me that and reminding me of it. He said, yeah, but Dan, I want to know what D-A-R-W-I-N stands for. <laughs> well, I said, I'm, uh, I'm no Greek scholar, but I do have a little high school lab, and let me think about it. And I went off to have a cup of coffee. Of course, there's no W in Latin, but there is a U. So I thought, what can I make out of D-A-R-W-I-N? And this is what I came up with. Delare. Remember Carthago Valenda S? Carthage is destroyed. Delete, destroy. Autora Merrill, the author of things. Put universum infinitum noscas. Destroy the author of things in order to understand. The <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry that had to come to an end. It's a sheer joy to be encouraged to think by a master of thinking. Every single sentence of Dan's lecture, it seemed to me, was a gem, an original thought, something we hadn't thought of before, something to set the mind racing. It's sheer pleasure and witty 
of that. Thank you very, very much, Dan. Uh, questions? Um, do we just stand up and ask them? We got the microphone there. the mimetic evolution uh, of uh, religious ideas, uh, obviously very interesting. Do you think that there is a parallel genetic evolution that ha has resulted in us having a genetically mediated propensity for religion? And can you say something about that? Um, yes, I think that the possibility of gene-mean coevolution is real. We already have several well-studied cases in other regards. For instance, um, the best-known case is, is lactose intolerance. Um, in those human lineages that had dairy farming, and of course that's not genetically transmitted, that's, that's culturally transmitted. Uh, in those lineages where there was a culture of dairy farming, there was genetic selection for uh, lactose tolerance in adulthood. And to such a great extent that so some of you probably are lactose intolerant, or some of you lactose intolerant. Uh, most of us uh, uh, in this part of the world, uh, but not, for instance, in parts of Asia where they didn't have uh, uh, a, a tradition of dairy farming, we're, we're lactose intolerant. That makes us rare for mammals. Uh, so if we were to use the proper mammalian standard, we wouldn't call uh, people who were lactose intolerant, we wouldn't call them lactose intolerant. Uh, we'd call the rest of us uh, digestively infantile. <laughs> you know? uh, um, so could this happen with religious means? I think it could. And uh, my uh, favorite example is, is the one that I mentioned, and that's where you have a tradition of of shamanic healing rituals, which could create a really quite strong selection pressure in favor of susceptibility to ritual. And it's widely known that there's quite a wide variability among people in how, how much they get turned on by ritual. And it could well turn out that um, those who are moved by ritual have uh, uh, ancestors who were where, uh, who were descended from people that had a long tradition of, of shamanic healing rituals. Because there could be, for instance, for childbirth, there could be quite strong selection pressure. The mothers that, that were not susceptible to ritual have a lot more trouble with childbirth than the mothers that, that, that were susceptible to those rituals. So that could have a quite striking effect. But once you've thought of one, you can begin to look for others. And I think there could, there could indeed be, there hasn't been much time We've had, well, we've had as long as we've had for, for lactose tolerance. Uh, so there is, that's enough time, but, but nothing proven yet, but that's a good thing to look for. So thank you very much for the lecture. Um, at the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned the five directions in which you think a religion could proceed. Yeah. And apart from obviously the last one, which in your personal opinion do you think, um, which end do you think would I think that we not only can, but will move in the direction of the creedless moral themes. That people will appreciate their allegiance to a tradition, to the music and the art and the holidays and the ceremonies, and that the uh, creed will become more and more vestigial. Uh, and it may even be maintained, but with no attempt at comprehension. And people may, I mean, we, we see so many signs of this uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Oxbridge colleges where they say Latin grace at high table, and probably not one person in 20 around the table knows or cares <laughs> what the Latin means, but it's sort of fun. Do you, do you say the Latin grace at the New College? Freddie Eyre, the famous philosopher, used to say the grace, and when challenged, he said, I will not utter falsehoods, but I have no objection to uttering meaningless statements. <laughs> I think 
I think we may get we may get religion going that way. One of the interesting features in that article uh, that I cited uh, about the collapse of evangelicalism is uh, his the author's Michael Spencer's concern that the trend in America with the evangelical churches is uh, they're dropping God's doctrine altogether. Doesn't care. You don't. They don't want to know what you believe. They don't care what you believe. They want you to be one with Jesus. But whatever that, that, that means to you, whatever it means to you. And what they are is, is sort of Kmart for the soul. <laughs> <laughs> and that may be very effective. And as long as they do good works and drop the, the political uh, uh, and social agendas that they have, what power to them? Nothing about it. Uh, first, I want to say I'm privileged to ask you a question because I do it by a lot. But can I ask, where do you think the evolution of quality has come into the evolution of religion? How qualia comes into qualia? Qualia, yes. <laughs> how human beings have qualia and how that has impacted our religion more than Well, one who before memes took up properly religion. Well, by qualia, you just mean the, the wonderful sights and sounds and flavors and colors of, of, of the century world. And uh, they've obviously played a big role uh, in, in uh, decorating and rendering more uh, attractive the, the world's religions. Not for nothing do the world's religions uh, go in for art in a big way and music uh, because um, these are wonderful ways of, of provoking love and wonder and awe and uh, uh, joy and thrill and so forth. And so they have been harnessed by all the world's religions. Uh, I think that's the most that I can say on that too. Do you think we should be memetically engineering things to make anti-religious memes? And if you do think so, uh, do you think your analysis provides the tools for doing that? Or should we be above such wickedness? And, um... <laughs> um, of course we should be involved in memetic engineering. There's a certain sense that that's what politics is. I think, I think the, the brilliant bus campaign uh, is a, is a fine example of that. I think... Uh, Except that it popped up from lots of other attempts and only it succeeded. Well, that's the way... The, 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 the best, the most brilliant mimetic engineers still have to live by Orville's second rule. And that is that evolution is cleverer than you are. Uh, there's a wonderful essay that Leonard Bernstein wrote, one of the great mimetic engineers of the 20th century, brilliant composer. And back in 1951 or two, he wrote an essay called, Why Don't You Write a Nice Gershwin Tune? And, uh, and he'd been unable to do this. And he was very frustrated, because he, he knew he was a genius. He was a musical genius, and he couldn't write a nice Gershwin tune. He couldn't make money on the hip rate. He actually wanted to make money on the hip rate. And he ends that essay with this wonderful, wistful, uh, remarks as if only someday I could walk down the street and hear somebody whistling one of my tunes. <laughs> well, a couple of years later, he wrote West Side Story and <laughs> he got his wish in space. But um, mimetic engineering is just as risky as genetic engineering. And so, of course, we should try to do it, but we should be very good at it of anybody who claims to be an expert. My, for my money, I would say that one of the best nomadic engineers in the business today is Rick Warren, Pastor Rick Warren. And if you want to uh, see a, a, an appreciation of his nomadic engineering, there's a piece of mine on TED, T -E -D .com, on the website, where I reverse engineer his book, The Purpose Driven Life. He's a very good pneumatic engineer, I just wish he would have had some different goals. <laughs> Thank you, that was very enjoyable. One of the things I most enjoyed was uh, a whole number of loose ends and um, open roads, I think, that you've deliberately 
set up in there, and I just wanted to pick up on, and I think it follows from the previous question, which is, uh, before moving on to actually doing some engineering, um, do, you have, do you have anything more to say about the taxonomy of possible experiments that one, of ethical experiments that might be run, or indeed picking up on you, that's the first part of it, I'm picking up on the second, the second thing you said was about um, doing something to make religions less virulent so that they can cohabit with us in a different sort of way. And it seems to me, one, using the analogy from biology and indeed, I suppose, from language, there ought to be a number of different ways of doing that, like making uh, uh, different sorts of vaccines, either with sort of dead, <laughs> dead uh, virus in or with uh, attenuated virus. Uh, do you have a sense of the beginnings of a taxonomy of possible ways before we before we opt for engineering. I don't have a worked out taxonomy for things to do, but I have a shopping list of <laughs> things to do, and I don't have it very well ordered yet. This is early days. I will tell you two things that I'm doing. One of them is I am uh, speaking to audiences in the United States actually encouraging them to adopt something not unlike and somewhat inspired by, by religious education here in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, I would like to see school children, both public schools, private parochial schools, and homeschoolers, obliged to learn just the basic facts about the world's religion, because I think that factual knowledge, that bland factual knowledge, is a great inoculant. I think if, if, if you just know a whole lot of facts about the diversity and variety of religions around the world, this, this demystifies and it sort, of, it sort of naturalizes it all in itself. And I've been fascinated talking with religious leaders about this because they know they hate the idea. Except for those who who uh, who welcome it, but those are the ones that are already they're already benign, uh, and there are there are whole there are whole denominations, the Episcopalians and the and the Unitarians and others who who already fall in that category. Uh, and they welcome this wholeheartedly. Uh, I want to try and uh, disentangle the, uh, the ideas of ethics and morality from those of religion. I want to start telling people that a lot of our ethical ideas are in fact instinctive. They're not only pre-literate, pre-cultural, but they're probably pre-human. And what really matters about right or wrong is the ability to exhibit a certain amount of altruism and group cooperation, and that's all it is really. But in your talk, you didn't really touch on this. You only uh, dealt with religion purely as a cultural phenomenon, it, uh, which could therefore only exist in a, a human and a verbal environment. But uh, should we be taking more trouble to disentangle ethics from religion, and then we can start telling our um, religious leaders that they're not up to the job because they're not actually <coughs> concentrating on new ethical problems that are arising in a rapidly changing environment. So I wonder whether, whether you have any thoughts on this, uh, how we can, whether we need to make this distinction and how we should go about it. Um, yes, indeed. And in fact, in, in two of my recent books, I've, I think, taken on exactly that project of looking at the uh, uh, if you like, the biological foundations of morality, but also uh, I, I take the page out of David Hume, who I think is one of the most yes. brilliant writers on this, who distinguished the, the, the natural virtues from what he called the artificial virtues, which were a, a, a cultural tuning and improvement of an expansion of the natural virtues. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that, uh, uh, say contrary, there's a lot of debate about this right now. Franz Duval, in a book like Good Nature, wants to suggest that there's sort of proto-morality proto in, in AIDS, for instance, in chimps. Um, I think the evidence is actually pretty thin. 
And I don't think in a way it matters, but actually I disagree with him about a lot of that because in any case, we have moved beyond what we share with the chimpanzees and with other animals, and, and for good reason. We're the one species that represents our reasons and can challenge each other's reasons in using language. And this representation of reasons is, for me, the key to morality. That's what makes us ethical agents, is the fact that we are, we respond to reasons. We are responsible. We can be, have words directed at us in a rational way, and we, can, we actually respond pretty well to that. That is a future that no other species has, and it is, to me, the key for ethics. Now, I also advocate that we should try, in a humanist, naturalist way, to we can now imagine the, the, the sort of ideal community to, of mutual persuasion, where we try to get everybody to agree about what we should all do. And everybody gets to speak. Nobody gets to play the faith card. In fact, any religious person says, well, you know, I'm a Hindu, and Hindus just can't discuss it. We said, well, very sorry, you just declared yourself disabled for this conversation. Uh, come back when you feel better. Uh, <laughs> we'd, like to, we'd like to have you in the conversation, but we won't accept the, the claim, well, I'm sorry, that's just unthinkable by somebody of my religious persuasion. We don't allow anybody to play that card. That way, we can, we can harvest the ethical wisdom from all the great books of the world, religious and non-religious. And everybody's tradition gets an equal chance. What, what we really want people who deeply believe in their own ethical traditions, their religious traditions coming out of their, I mean, the ethical traditions coming out of their religious traditions, who, people who have a tremendous allegiance, <coughs> the message to them is, okay, we'd like to hear why you think this is so good, your responsibility to your religion, to your God, is to convince the rest of us in terms that, that, that we can accept. That's taking them seriously. It's taking their moral prohibitions and demands seriously. And if they can't do it, if they refuse to do it, we say, well, sorry, you're not part of the discussion. But they're welcome to try, but not in their terms, and they don't get to play the faith. good fortune coming from a very large and genetically successful family. <laughs> Most of whom um, went to Catholic schools. I went to a Catholic school in, here in London. And they gave up on me when I was 15. But um, what I want to say is when my nephew and I, who's also here, get together with this huge family, what we notice is that why do so many of the family who will passionately believe in Catholic religion why do they continue to feel that way and be so locked in until they die? We're taking the whole, the whole spectrum of the family. And he and I are lone voices and we try and behave ourselves when we have this together. But why, does, why, does the family, why do people get locked in? Why do they get in? They never come out of it. it. It's very difficult. I can understand what you presented about how it happens. But why don't people pop after it? Well, I, I would take your statement as an eloquent commentary on just how well-designed religions are. Uh, it's quite remarkable, as you say, that such a tenacious hold on people who are basically, you know, they're healthy and sane. They're not, they're not, they're not wackos. And yet, for no doubt, a whole variety of reasons. They just cannot find maybe the courage to think about these issues. In fact, one of the one of the really uh, uh, powerful ideas is the idea of uh, of sacred truths. And a sacred truth is one that even thinking about it is evil. Don't even think about it. And when you can establish that about anything, when you can build that taboo against thinking and, and internalize it, and people internalize it, then they become, they become their own jailers. They, they, they become very effective uh, 
uh, protectors of, of their own incarceration. Uh, that's what I think getting to school children early would make much more difficult. I think, I think the effect of, of that early schooling, uh, people say, well, but the homeschoolers, they'd never teach this material with any sympathy. I, I don't care. They can teach it with maximal lack of sympathy. They can say, this is the word of the devil. This is evil, obnoxious, obscene stuff, but you've got to learn it because you're going to be tested on it. <laughs> Still, they're going to have to adjust everything else they say. They're going to have to adjust how they tell their children about their own religion because of their children will just have these facts. That's what I think, it's a sort of an inoculation against certain sorts of brainwashing. I, I agree with that, but also I'm wondering whether, especially in the Catholic case, it's, a, it's some kind of childhood imprinting. I was very impressed. Uh, a few months ago, I interviewed for television Father George Coyne, yeah. who is the, or was, the Vatican chief astronomer, a highly intelligent man, excellent uh, scientist. And he finally, I got him to say, I'll be absolutely honest with you, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to believe in God. He said that. So I obviously said, well then, why do you? <laughs> and he said, I was brought up Catholic. Well, by the way, that, that interview that Richard did it is on the web, and it is, it is simply a model of how to deal with somebody like this. I, I think it's some of the most brilliant television I've seen in a long time, because you are completely respectful and, and polite, at the same time you are relentless in, in pushing in the nicest possible way. And the point is a sweetie, and, and, he's, and he's such a reasonable person, and that's exactly the way to treat such a person, and you back him into a corner, and he's just so honest that in the end, he says all sorts of things that he probably wished he didn't say. <laughs> the tragedy is that that, that entire interview was, was cut um, by the television company. But it, it is on the web. Um, it's on richarddawkins.net um, as, um, as a complete uncut interview. Why the television company chose to cut it, I, I don't know. <laughs> because I also did the Archbishop of Canterbury, and they thought they shouldn't have both. But, <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor uh, Dan. I just had a question about this is not just religion, all the other irrational means, they seem to stick to people's mind. And sometimes it's not just the usage. I quote yourself about one of the philosophical ideas that we call preposterous the idea of zombies. And that has stuck in the quite an enlightened discipline and uh, is very difficult to erase. And what's it, is it just a use? Because zombies, they don't offer them 72 virgins in heaven or something like that. <laughs> well, don't get me started about the irrationalities in the, in the theory of consciousness research. But I think there is a common thread. And it's fear. Um, I have a new piece on free will in a, in a volume uh, edited by, I think, Roy Baumeister on the psychology of, of free will. And uh, I, I tell a little story about when I was a graduate student in Oxford and I had to forge a signature for uh, a friend who was, who was, uh, uh, he was a Marshall scholar and he was supposed to be in Oxford and collect his stipend, and he was in fact in France in a restaurant. <laughs> so I had to forge his signature so that he could, I could deposit his stipend in the, in the bank. And I practiced his signature several hundred times till I could do it just beautifully. Then I made a big mistake. When the bill, when the thing came, the form came, I, I sat down to sign it. Signed over on the side, six hundred. Then when I went to sign it, my hand just shook terribly. So, and I'm not cut out for life of larceny. What I realized afterwards is that I should have had, had my wife embed that line of paper with ten other pieces so I wouldn't know which one was, was being signed. Then I would have done it flawlessly. It's this 
when the stakes are high, you get rattled. And I think that what happens with the zombie case is a case of this, or with the free will case. People, very smart philosophers, write real garbage sometimes. <laughs> because, because the stakes are so high, they are sure that free will matters so much, or they're so sure that if consciousness isn't supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, <laughs> then the world will come tumbling down, and you know, there won't be any meaning to life unless, unless it's something magical. And so they're sort of desperate. And so they cling to these ideas that are, as you say, irrational. It's their, it's their talisman against, against nihilism or something like that. So I, I argue, you know, chill out. These aren't so bad. You can have, you can have my kind of consciousness, and that's all you ever really need in it. Christopher Hitchens, when asked the inevitable, do you believe in free will question, says, I have no choice. <laughs> And we will 
give them that much respect, but this sort of hyper-deference that they're so used to. I think one of the best things we can all do is simply drop the hyper-deference. You don't have to be rude, you just drop the hyper-deference altogether and treat, treat religious claims like any political claim, any, any issue of opinion at all, uh, and make no apology for it, and you will certainly wrong foot a lot of people, you will irritate a lot of people, but you will also teach them something. Thank you, Pesha, bring that to a close. Um, who was it who said we should respect the other fellow's religion, but only to the extent that we respect his belief that his wife is beautiful and his children smart. <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right about the, um, the insult my religion is equivalent to insulting my wife. Uh, that clearly is true in the case of the um, Muslim so-called hurt or offense or in insult about the Danish cartoons. You insult the Prophet Muhammad. Um, you insult is equivalent to insulting my wife, except that I'm not sure how many of the people insulted actually do respect their wives very much. <laughs> <laughs> We've had an absolute feast of reason and wonderful wit and wonderful feast for the mind. Dan, thank you very much. Um, Holly Toynbee is going to say a few words to close.